good morning and uh, welcome to this first introductory lecture in mechanical operations. Um, I think before you learn any subject, it is good to understand why you should learn the subject. So I think what I would like to do today is um, just talk about you know, what is mechanical operations and why should you study it, particularly as a chemical engineer. Um, so mechanical operation, as the name suggests, it is um, it's a process that primarily involves mechanical forces. So one way to differentiate a mechanical operation from other types of operations is you could think about chemical operations which would be a, a chemical reaction for example or an electrical operation or a, a computational operation, a simulation operation, a management operation. So these are all different types of processes that are done every day in industry. But a mechanical operation is, um, is unique in the sense that you are typically, as I was saying, importing a mechanical field or force to an object in order to produce a certain product or service to your customer. Uh, another way to define a mechanical operation would be to say it is the processing of solid matter or processing of particulate matter because many times mechanical operations involve interaction of your applied force field with solid materials. And if you look at industry, there are many examples of such mechanical operations. And if you look at your, even your daily life, there are many, many mechanical operations that we undertake not even consciously. So let us start with maybe your daily life. So I will give you some examples of mechanical operations and maybe you can tell me why you would consider it a mechanical operation. Breathing, do you think breathing is a mechanical operation? Yes, why? Uh, okay. Um, sure. I mean, it involves essentially pumping of uh, air, right? And you know, sucking in and pumping out of air. But there is also another way in which it is a mechanical operation, and that is um, in the context of filtration. As you will see later in the course, filtration is a very critical mechanical operation. And as you know, our noses have this mucous membrane which keeps out all the bad stuff and prevents it from entering our bodies which is how we are able to survive otherwise we would be ingesting all kinds of things that our body would not like. So our, our nose is a very, very effective filter. So filtration is, is um, uh, involved in breathing and it is certainly a mechanical operation. So you can imagine you know swallowing virtually everything that we do and by the way our skin itself uh, presents a barrier um, to many of the chemicals and pollutants that are out there. Uh, in fact, the reason that nanotechnology is, is considered potentially harmful is because nanoparticles are small enough they can actually diffuse through the pores in your skin and enter your bloodstream. So um, these particles actually can be effectively filtered out by your nose, but your skin cannot filter them out, right. So in that case, you know, it's a, it's a mechanical operation that's failing. Your skin is not able to keep out these nanopollutants, which is why, for example, in, in modern warfare or even terrorism, uh, chemical attacks are considered a lot more harmful than even bombs because chemicals can penetrate into your body and there's no way you can, you can stop them, which is why chemical warfare is prohibited in, uh, at least in most civilized countries. Okay, so breathing. Um, so what do you do when you first get up? You brush your teeth, I hope. Yeah. So is that a mechanical operation? Of course, right? Because your brush is uh, contacting your teeth and doing some cleaning. So what is the mechanism there? What is the operation? How does a brush remove material from your teeth? It is called abrasion, right? 
it is actually abrading materials that are stuck to your teeth. Sometimes it is also abrading plaque, sometimes even enamel. So, if you over brush, it is actually bad because you start removing the protective enamel on your teeth. So, that is a mechanical process that is known as abrasion. Okay, so after you brush, what do you do? You, how many people here drink coffee? Nobody drinks coffee. How many people don't drink coffee? Wow, what do you drink instead? Milk, tea. Okay. So, um, do you take uh, sugar with your milk? Okay. So, is there a mechanical operation involved there? Dissolving the sugar, right? Hmm? Stirring, dissolution. Well, dissolution is the operation. There are many mechanisms by which you can enhance the rate of dissolution. One of them is heat, hot milk dissolves sugar faster, stirring and also if you make the sugar cubes finer, sugar crystals finer, they dissolve faster because we will we'll look at that later also in the course. So, clearly stirring milk into sugar into your milk and drinking there is a mechanical operation there. How about if you drink coffee? I know there are not too many of you. but Instant coffee very similar right, you have to take the instant coffee powder and dissolve it otherwise it is not coffee or if you drink filter coffee again there is a mechanical operation involved in the filtration right? I mean how do you how do you prepare filter coffee? You start with the coffee beans and then what do you do to them? Grinding classical mechanical operation right. First the beans are ground and then the powder is filtered and that is how you make the filtrate for your for your coffee. So, it is clearly coffee is um, coffee or milk. How about tea? Is there any mechanical operation in tea? How do you prepare your tea with bags? Let us say you use bags to prepare your tea. Is there a mechanical operation there? What is it? It is not just dissolution, right? It is diffusion and leaching. You are actually trying to get the tea to leach out of the bag and mix into the hot water or hot milk. So, these are also mechanical operations. All right, so, let us say you have done with the drinking and by the way um, water, I assume you, you maybe you brush your teeth with the purified water or you drink purified water, is there a mechanical operation there? Water purification, how does purification of water happen? There is UV and stuff which is the chemical process, but there is also a carbon filter right. So, removal of organics, smell using activated carbon charcoal again that is a mechanical process um, and of course, the, the filtration to remove sediments in water again classical mechanical operation. The process of sedimentation is a mechanical operation and the um, use of sedimentation as a mechanism to remove particles from water is a mechanical operation. I do not know if many of you know, but yesterday we inaugurated a brand new building or one floor in our MSRC building. <coughs> Professor Pradeep in chemistry has just um, inaugurated this um, uh, technical unit of excellence in water and is, is used, he has developed water purification technology using nanomaterials, right. So, classical example again of uh, a mechanical operation. By the way, um, as I was saying in the previous class, mechanical operation typically has a connotation of involving and dealing with large particles, but that is not necessarily true anymore. Many of uh, the traditional mechanical operations can be just can be done much more effectively by using micro micron dimensional or nano dimensional materials. So, as part of the course, we will also deal with nanotechnology to a large extent. Um, because even some of the traditional mechanical operations like grinding can actually be used to make nanoparticles. So, that connect is lost to many people. In, there is this impression that mechanical operation starts at a certain size, you know we make huge rocks into small boulders. That is really not where it stops. By the definition of mechanical operations, it continues all the way down to the nano range and even smaller sizes. All right, so let us continue our daily life review. Um, how about eating? Let us say you have breakfast, is there a me any mechanical operation involved there? Chewing, right? Chewing is a 
heavily mechanical in its nature. You're, you're crushing the, the food, you're grinding it, you're converting it into a paste, you're dissolving it in your saliva. So eating and of course the digestion part, all of that, if you wanted to study it scientifically, you would probably need a chemical engineer that has exposure to mechanical operations to be able to do that because that is what they are even though you do not think of them that way. All right, so let us say you have eaten, um, bathing, I do not know, I do not know if you would call that a mechanical operation but uh, drying actually, all of you dry after you bathe you are drying your body right, drying of solids is a mechanical operation. In fact, there is a whole chapter in McCabe and Smith dedicated to drying of solids. Um, what are the most effective ways, most uh, efficient ways, so drying. Uh, Let us say then you get on your cycle or you walk to class, is there a mechanical operation there? You have to look at your body as a solid right and you are essentially transporting yourself to wherever your destination is. So you are cycling, what is it that you are fighting all the time? Drag. So drag on a solid is a very important parameter in the design of mechanical operations. Just like you would want to design your cycle and your attire and your helmet to be aerodynamic in shape to minimize drag. In many industrial processes that involve flow of solids, you would want to minimize drag in order to minimize pressure drop in equipment, things like that. So um, just the process of walking or running or cycling or even sitting in a car and going from one place to another, that is a mechanical operation by the way. It is called um, conveyance or transport. When you move a solid or a collection of solids from one place to another that is called a mechanical operation or if you just set the solid in one place and it stays there that is a mechanical operation called storage. Storage, handling, transport, conveyance these are all mechanical operations obviously they are employed in industry to a large extent but when you think about it all of that happens in our, in our daily life also. Um, what else? You come to class, you sit, let us say I write something on the blackboard with a chalk, is that a mechanical operation? How, how, because how does chalk writing work? You are actually transferring dust or particles from the, from your chalk to the blackboard right? So that again it involves generation of particles, it involves size reduction which chalk will keep getting smaller as you, as you write more and more and you are transferring your chalk dust to the blackboard and the particles have to stick adhesion in order to form letters and words. These are all classical mechanical operations and afterwards after I am done with the class I have to wipe off, wiping or removing <coughs> solid particulate materials from a surface is a mechanical operation, it is called departiculation or even writing on paper, how do you, how do you form letters using ink? mechanical operation, transference right. Um, so what else, what else, I mean obviously there are things you do like with scissors or with uh, pliers or with whatever, I mean clearly those are mechanical operations, if you cut something or if you slice something, if you are eating a cake and you slice it that is a mechanical operation. So I am sure you can think of many examples. Um, if you use a fan is that a mechanical operation there, you are using a fan for cooling. What does a fan do? It rotates right, the centrifugal motion of a solid object is a, is a mechanical operation. The purposes can be different, you know you can use a centrifugal field actually to accelerate sedimentation, you know we will talk about sedimentation later, settling of particles. If you want to speed up the rate of settling, one way you do that is by applying a centrifugal field which will increase the effective force of gravity, right. Um, okay, why do not anybody wants to try come up with some example from just your daily life that you think involves a mechanical operation? 
Okay, maybe before we do that, let me try to define what are mechanical operations that might help you. Um, I think you can, from what we have discussed so far, you get, get a feel for what are the different types of mechanical operations. But to be more explicit, um, one of the, as we have been discussing, separation of particles from the medium that they are suspended in is a crucial mechanical operation because that is something that we have to do many, many times in many contexts. So whether it is whether it's separation of one solid from a mixture of solids or whether it is separation of a solid from a liquid in which it is suspended or separation of a solid from air, these are separation processes and they are one example of a mechanical operation which we will study later on at some length. The other type of mechanical operation is classification. Classification is somewhat related to separation but the intent is not so much to separate but to categorize. For example, you may have uh, a collection of particles and you may want to know what is the number of particles in various size ranges. You want to know the number of particles between 10 microns to 50 microns, 50 to 100, 100 to 200, 200 to 500, 500 microns to a millimeter, larger than a millimeter, right? So to, to separate particles by size, or not even to separate, to, to differentiate particles by size, it's called classification by size. Obviously, you can classify based on other parameters as well. You can classify by shape. You can, again, in a, in a population of particles, you can try and understand how many are spherical in shape, how many are cylindrical, how many are crystalline, and so on. So that is called classification by shape. You can classify by density. Um, you can classify by what? There are so many parameters. You can by composition, by type of material, whether it is organic or inorganic. Um, metallic or non-metallic, magnetic or non-magnetic. So, you know, there are many, many ways in which you can classify a set of solids or a set of particles. So, classification is another example of a, a mechanical operation. Um, what is another? I think size reduction is a crucial mechanical operation. Of course, and it is inverse which is size enlargement. So size reduction typically happens when you have large bulk solids to deal with and you want to break them down into smaller sizes in order to be able to use them in your process. But size enlargement can also sometimes be necessary um, where you are trying to get particles to agglomerate to each other and grow to a certain size. Um, in fact, you will see that in many filtration systems, agglomeration actually helps because you know filters, filter efficiency starts dropping as particle size decreases. Finer particles are more difficult to filter compared to larger particles. So if you can get the particles to agglomerate before they encounter the screen, you, you actually have a better chance of filtering them out. So particle agglomeration or, en or enlargement of particles is also an important um, mechanical operation. Um, particle transport. So in many cases, we are trying to, for example, in pharma, pharmaceutical manufacturing, where you are making tablets and drugs and so on, you are actually producing these um, fine particles, but they have to be conveyed to a location where they can be captured and stored and then packaged and shipped and so on. So in such situations, it is very important for you to track how particles can be made to flow in a very controlled manner in such a way that they follow streamlines. You know, you do not want turbulence. You essentially want the particles to follow certain streamlines of flow. And in such cases, particle transport becomes important, but there are many related mechanisms. There is particle deposition, 
For example, if you are trying to convey particles through a tube, you do not want the particles to deposit on the walls because that leads to loss of materials. You want them to follow the flow. Um, adhesion and re-entrainment. Um, when particles for example do get stuck to a surface, you at least want them to be able to re-entrain them in the flow. So you do not want extremely strong adhesive forces. So particle to surface adhesion becomes an important issue. And finally parameters like particle sticking, particle conformation, particle removal, all of these are important sub processes in the overall process of particle transport. In other words, you cannot study particle transport simply by tracking its velocity. You also have to be aware of the various interactions that are possible between the particles and between particles and surfaces that they come in contact with. So, uh, all of these are again important transport processes. We talked about things like uh, dissolution, dissolution, sublimation, burning, these are all mechanical operations also. And the rate at which these phenomena happen can have a huge influence on your process efficiency and thereby on your cost efficiency of the, of the process that you are trying to run. So you have to have a good understanding of the relationship between the basic properties of a particle and their effect on these functional aspects. Um, so if you look at all these, all these different processes, what is common to all of them is that they all depend on certain basic characteristics of particles. So particle characterization is another important aspect of mechanical operations, uh, particularly things like size and shape because every process that we talked about is hugely influenced by two things, the, what are called the morphological properties of the particle that is shape and size. More than any other properties of particles, shape and size which by the way as we will discuss later are mutually dependent. You cannot define size exclusively of shape and you cannot define shape exclusively of size but together they exert the largest influence on the nature of the processes that, um, that we were just talking about. Now there are many other ancillary particular processes that uh, we will cover as time permits but these are the, the primary processes that, uh, that we will focus on during the course. So having said that again maybe you can think back to what you do you know as your daily routine and um, give me some examples. But maybe even before we do that let us also talk about industrial processes. I mentioned that the other place where mechanical operations play a huge role is in virtually every manufacturing industry that is out there. Um, so let us take um, an example. Um, as you know power generation in India is primarily through burning of coal. So coal processing, coal fired power plants really supply the energy needs of the country. So when you, th when you think about coal and how it is processed in a power plant, virtually all these processes that we have been talking about will be applied somewhere or the other. So you start with mining of coal right. Is mining a mechanical operation? Yes. Mining is a mechanical operation because it is a mechanical process. You know you are essentially dealing with these large solids of particulate matter and you are trying to take them out of the mines that they are and bring them out so that they can be used. Of course there are other ways in which you can use coal instead of bringing it out and burning it. You can gasify it you know coal gasification technology is now becoming important. So in that case it is not a mechanical operation but as long as you are following the conventional route of taking coal out of mines and bringing them to a, a power plant it is a, it's a mechanical operation. So once, once you take all the coals out what do you do? You pile them onto these huge trucks right and you transport them to wherever the power plant is located. So again that is a mechanical operation conveyance of solid from one place to the other. Um, and once you reach the power plant what do you do? You unload the coal 
you store it somewhere till you need it because we, we are not using a continuous flow process right you do not mine the coal today and burn it the same day. Typically coal that is brought from mines is stored in large silos for several days sometimes weeks and it is also blended by the way very few pure coals are used in other words if you look at a power plant and the, and the coal that it takes in it is usually a blend of coals from different places it is even a blend of Indian coals and foreign coals which by the way have totally different characteristics the Indian coals have high ash low sulphur foreign coals typically have low ash high sulphur. So, when you mix them it is the worst of both worlds you have high ash and high sulphur uh, ash causes fouling slagging all that kind of stuff uh, sulphur causes corrosion. So, that is all badness anyway um, so this blending that is again blending or mixing is a mechanical operation. Let us say you have blended the coals and you have kept them uh, when you need them what do you do obviously the coals are too large to burn as is. So, the first thing you do is crushing you crush them down to a few centimeters of size there are different types of crushers we will talk about. Uh, so, they will take them from several meters to centimeters to millimeters and then you go into mills. The mills will then take particles that are several centimeters and break them down to millimeters and a few particles down in the micron size range also. There is a lot of size reduction involved. Size reduction is uh, the key operation in feeding coal into a combustor because the size distribution of the coal is is key you do not you want to control it very carefully. Um, you do not want the coals to be too large because you know basically burning efficiency scales with particle size inversely with particle size burning time goes as particle size squared. So, as you make the particle smaller and smaller it burns faster and faster. So, for a combustion efficiency viewpoint you want the coals to be fine but if you make them too fine what happens they kind of escape the burning process altogether um, because in order for combustion to happen you have to mix the coal with an oxidizer and bring it to a certain temperature and let it burn. So, it is very important that you have contact continuous contact between the hot gas and the coal particle so that it will burn and if you have particles that are too large they will settle as bottom ash material and if you have particles that are too fine they will essentially flow out and they will never experience a combustion process. So, you need a, a, a size distribution that is well controlled in an intermediate size range which maximizes combustion efficiency while minimizing losses due to settling and elutriation and so. Um, so, clearly that is involved and, and of course, the next process is the burning of coal and as, as I was mentioning um, any is, is the burning of coal a mechanical operation or a chemical operation. Well, how does coal burn I mean it is basically carbon that is reacting with oxygen to form CO2 and CO and H2O and all that. So, it is the reaction itself is a chemical reaction, but is there a is there a mechanical component to it. See when you think about it what what controls the rate at which the combustion happens and how complete the combustion is is the physical nature of the particle the size distribution the shape distribution and the structure of the particle. Um, for example, a coal that is uh, very porous in structure compared to a coal that has much less porosity will burn very differently. What controls the porosity it is the ash content the more ash you have ash is essentially the useless part right because it will just survive the combustion process it does not add to the calorific value of the coal and it, it will survive the combustion process and you will have these chunks of uh, mineral matter that you have to dispose of somehow. Uh, so, there is fly ash that again leaves to the combustion gases and there is bottom ash that collects at the you know base of the, um, the combustor. So, ash is well now we are trying to find commercial use for ash by the way particularly the fly ash can be mixed with uh, tar and actually be used for 
building roads. So that is an application that is increasingly finding vogue. But in general, ash is useless material and you want to maximize the carbon content because carbon is what burns and gives you the calorific value. Moisture content is another one that does not help you in any way. The higher the moisture content in the coal, the less its calorific value. And by the way, um, that is why if uh, coal has been stored for a period of time and it is either been exposed to rain or just humidity conditions, one of the steps before you burn the coal is to dry the coal in order to remove the excess moisture and improve its, um, its combustion efficiency. So the feeding the coal and burning the coal involves many mechanical operations. Now what happens after you burn the coal? Um, you have all the emissions to deal with, right? I mean what you are recovering is basically the heat energy, that is what you want. But you do not get just the heat, you also get mass. You have all this um, um, toxic chemicals that are getting vented out into the environment. So what do you need to do? You have to filter them out. So you have to have abatement technologies that take care of airborne pollutants that can be released when you burn coal. But the other type of contaminant that you have from burning coal is all these particles that survive the combustion process like ash. What do they, what does ash do? It, it deposits on surfaces. Um, so in, in a, for example, in a coal fired boiler you have a radiant section and a convection section. The temperature in the radiant section is much higher and the coal that the, the, or the ash that deposits in the radiant section is in the form of a molten what they call slag. So slag deposition happens in the radiant section. Downstream as the temperature gets cooler you start <coughs> depositing uh, solid material and that process is known as fouling. So slagging and fouling are both mechanical processes that have a deleterious effect on your operational efficiency. So you want to design your system to minimize fouling and slagging. Um, fouling especially can cause erosion. Erosion is another mechanical process or mechanical operation uh, which is mostly harmful but sometimes can be used in a beneficial way also. Erosion refers to the um, high energy impact of a solid particle on a surface which causes material to be removed from the surface. So if you have a solid ash particle hitting a stainless steel you know tube, heat exchanger tube and actually gouging out the steel material from the tube that is called erosion of the tube and it is certainly something you do not want. Severe erosion can cause a complete breakdown of the heat exchanger system altogether. <coughs> erosion can also happen where you have you know an assembly of particles and one particle comes and hits this assembly and knocks off another particle that is also called erosion. Um, sometimes that can help you because erosion essentially means that once um, for example if your ash particles depositing once they build to a certain height they will now start getting knocked off due to the erosion process. So they kind of reach a steady state they do not keep growing. So erosion in a way can help you also. In the slagging regime you have corrosion possible because it is a liquid material and if you have suspended sulphur or chlorides in it, it can cause corrosion to get initiated. So corrosion is a chemical process which is a consequence of a mechanical process because the, the deposition of a corrosive layer is a prerequisite for surface corrosion to be initiated, right. Um, so these are some mechanical operations that are involved in feeding coal, burning the coal, taking out the product, uh, dealing with the, the pollutants that result from the process um, and then finally what happens? You are extracting the heat energy into a system and when you do that let us say that um, uh, you are just uh, using it in a boiler then the application is straightforward. But what if you are using it in a turbine? Then what do you do? Basically you are trying to extract not only the heat energy but also the momentum. In a turbine what happens? The combustion gases come out and you actually have these turbine blades, right? Uh, rotor blades and stators that extract momentum from the combustion gases and thereby they, um, the rotor blades start rotating and they produce energy, right? 
So this is a, again an example of a mechanical operation where the rotational aspect of the solid is really what is giving you the uh, process efficiency that you are looking for. As chemical engineers one of the things you should always keep in mind I think the, the primary advantage that chemical engineering has as a discipline compared to other disciplines is that it is the only discipline where process optimization, process control, process analysis, process monitoring are actually offered as courses where, where you get systematic training in these aspects. So one of the things that you should learn to do is really look at the system as a whole, understand all the input parameters, all the output parameters and the relationships between them and try to come up with uh, algorithms or designs where that you can use to optimize and control the process. And as you do that in many industries, mechanical operations are going to be very critical for you to understand and characterize. Clearly you know whether you are in power plants or in cement factories or uh, any manufacturing industry that, that involves um, solid to solid contact. I think the involvement of mechanical operations is obvious. But let us say that you are working in an industry that you might think is not really connected to mechanical operations like um, hard drives, you all use hard drives right. Um, how are hard drives manufactured, hard disk drives? It is it's a, it's an electronic component where you are writing data and retrieving data from these magnetic um, storage disks. But if you look at the process by which these um, disks are made, what do you, what do you need? The, the disk on which you are writing the data, what is its primary, one of its primary characteristics is it has to be highly polished, it has to be extremely smooth in order for you to be able to write the data and retrieve the data. So there is a process called disk burnishing that is done to these uh, memory disks before they are assembled into a disk stack. It is essentially a process by which you take a rough surface and you polish it to the smoothness or roughness that you require. So surface roughening, surface smoothening are also mechanical operations that can be very important in certain industries. Um, if, you, if you ever, ever looked at a hard drive you know if you actually take it apart you will be amazed to see that it is essentially a mechanical assembly, it has got thousands of components in it got lots of screws and washers and seals and little gadgets. How do you put it all together? There is, there is a in any hard drive assembly operation there are about a hundred sequential steps where you put things together. Any assembly, any mechanical assembly is a mechanical operation that generates a very large amount of particles. As you can imagine if you take two surfaces and you use a threaded screw to put them together what is happening? If you could actually you know use a particle counter and sniff close to where you are putting the screw into the, into the threaded hole you will see that for every turn of the screw you are generating millions of particles. What do you do with these? You know how do you, how do you minimize this? How do you lubricate this operation? It is also a friction issue because the particles are being generated because of the friction between the screw head and the threaded hole as you are inserting the screw. By, def by using a lubricant you should be able to minimize it right. So this is again a mechanical operation um, when any mechanical assembly of two surfaces to one another is to be considered a mechanical operation. But it is as a chemical engineer Again we have to take the responsibility for optimizing even a simple mechanical operation as screwing two surfaces together. How do you do that? Using a lubricant. What is the drawback of using a lubricant? The lubricant itself can then become a contaminant you know. If you use too much lubricant you can start spewing out lubricant. There are, two, there are different types of lubricants. There are solid lubricants and there are liquid lubricants they have advantages and disadvantages. Liquid lubricants obviously have much more lubricity but they are also more likely to you know be, be uh, emitted when, when the product is functioning. A solid lubricant may have less lubricity but it is unlikely to, mo to be very mobile. So once you have used the lubricant it is likely to stay in place. 
these are again examples of things that you need to you need to think about um, as a, a mechanical operation. So I think very quickly uh, I will just give you one chance can someone name something you do in your daily life that is a mechanical operation for bonus marks. Think about it maybe you know when you have time write down a list of things that you do and, and the thing though I think that we interesting is as we go through this course we will be detailing the actual mechanisms involved in these mechanical operations you know something as simple as brushing your teeth can you model it can you develop a mathematical model for brushing your teeth you know maybe I should have a project element in this in this course and ask each of you to develop a model for a, for various mechanical processes. If you can do that you know maybe you can design a better brush or a better way to brush um, you know there are people have invented these vibrating brushes right well, why is that because it improves your efficiency of brushing why do how did they do that by treating it as a mechanical operation and optimizing it I am sure a chemical engineer invented the vibrating brush. So there is lots of opportunities you know mechanical operations as I said can easily be viewed as a very mundane subject but actually when you think about it it is a very exciting subject and I think you will get to use a lot of your, your talents um, as you go through this course all right any questions okay so I will see you in the next class then.